right, we are live. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to yet another episode of Industrial Logics Live events this month, where we are talking about our engineering practices. Um, so moving forward, today's topic is better product management using probabilistic forecasting. And we have a very distinguished panel of speakers here, all of them Agile coaches from Industrial Logic. Uh, and we are gonna dig, di dig deeper into this topic. But before uh, we go there, I have a few announcements to make. Uh, Industrial Logic is actually offering uh, you to book a free Q&A session. If you have any questions you related to our engineering services, or you want to book a one hour session to discuss your particular needs, feel free to scan this QR code or visit the URL uh, in the slide and you'll be able to reach out to us and we can set up some time for you to go over your needs. Uh, Industrial Logic is also offering a 20% discount on our next public technical excellence workshop. So if you're interested, you can use this discount code, which is only available for a limited time up to September 18th. Uh, and you can get that discount on our workshops. With that, uh, Today's topic, we're gonna cover uh, four uh, sections of the topic. We're gonna talk about why we need estimates, what is probabilistic forecasting, the role of forecasting in product management, and understanding Monte Carlo. With that, I'll go ahead to my uh, panel and I'll pose my first question. Why do we even need estimates? So Wyatt, if you can proceed from there. Hey, Wyatt, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank All you. All right, go ahead. All right, awesome, thanks. Yeah, so why do we need estimates? Uh, oh my goodness, so there are a number of reasons why. Um, part of an or organization, let's, let's say uh, they have a, a marketing campaign and they need to understand when um, they can promote uh, some products that are going to be uh, live. Right. Uh, another reason could be you have your you're working in an organization has silos and then uh, silos, meaning uh, different teams, different component teams. And you want to be able to be able to um, show when you'll be able to be done with something. So then, you know, your partner to the left or to the, to, or to the right can consume that and, and use it. So, yeah, there are a number of reasons to have estimates. It, it's a way of a visually communicating, are we on track or are we not? So what has been a traditional way of estimating and how is probabilistic forecasting different to that? Well, one of the things that's become popular in the last 20 years was the use of story points, which have been largely decided to be unhelpful. Um, they were a nice version of relative sizing. So one job takes you, you know, a half day. The other job looks like it's got twice as much stuff in it, juice. Um, so it seems like, you know, it's got more juice. And the other one is twice as bad. Call the first one a one, call the second one a two, you know, pick a number. Um, of course, this has problems is that, that when you have numbers attached to them, people believe that uh, there's some magic constant K so story points times K equals full duration. And the fact is, it is an estimate. And I'm sure Perry will want to weigh in on it. Estimates have a range, right? So it'll be between two hours and three days, typically. So there isn't a magic constant that we can use. We need a better system for deciding when we can start the next thing. And also, of course, people need the estimates because they want to know um, when they can't see the changes, when they can start to see the next change. And uh, we find that that's, uh, it's a way of working and a lot of people do it that way, but there are other ways as well. I'll just hold that for now. Yeah, and um, just to add to that, when, when those estimates inevitably end up being wrong, what we've sort of always done in the past is get a bigger magnifying glass and spend more time and look more closely at the problem and try to try to get better. And it, it just doesn't work, right? We, we've tried it over and over again, tried to spend multiple days creating these estimates and it, it, we, we don't end up coming up with better, more accurate estimates. That's why they call it a swag. Yeah. 
Um, a, a friend of mine, a colleague, a mentor that uh, I worked with for a number of years uh, once said, you know, all estimates are lies. You know, it's just the one we give is the best lie that we have right now. And uh, the trouble we get into is the, the minute we start taking an estimate and turning it into a commitment on a, a date. And it's not based on any strong, you know, uh, physical science or evidence. So, yeah, uh, estimates are a tricky thing. Uh, if if I was a customer, the first question I might want to ask are, are you done yet? You know, and if the answer is no, the next question on my mouth is, so when are you going to be done? And that's fundamentally the question, getting back to why do we need estimates? That seems to be the, the you know, the main question we need to be able to, uh, you know, faithfully be able to share with a customer or a client or stakeholder. There's a, a nice little piece with that is that <clears throat> despite what McConnell said in his book, um, most places there's a game around estimation, right? right. So <clears throat> the team says this is, you know, whatever way they say a week's worth of work, then somebody else is who has interest in the feature is like, well, could it be in half that time or could it be in two thirds that time or could it be at 80%? How, how low can you go? And so sometimes this evolves into a negotiation rather than an estimate. Now, of course, if we think it'll take a week and you talk us down to three, we still think it's a week. We've just agreed to go along with what you've demanded, which means that generally speaking, estimates don't come in short. Estimates almost always are going to, I mean, they don't come in long, sorry. <clears throat> estimates almost always are too tight to be reliable but people don't feel free to say that this estimate is too tight, that it won't really be done. There's a political uh, power relationship problem there. So I know it's a week, but you've talked me down to three. That doesn't mean it'll be three. And now all of our estimates, when we add them together to see when we're going to finish a big job, are almost always going to be tremendously short because all of the little estimates we added were short. This shows us again that we need some way of forecasting that isn't prone to that kind of societal, you know, internal pressure in the company that people won't talk us down to something that we don't believe in. Um, instead, that we can find a date that is likely to be true. Yeah, awesome. You yeah, go ahead. Uh, Tim, you mentioned uh, Steve McConnell's book, and one of the things I re remember getting out of that is that in, inherent in all of us is a desire to be really super accurate. And so when somebody comes and asks me for an estimate, I'm predisposed to try and say, well, I'll be done on Tuesday of October or whatever, you know, you know, something very precise when the truth is I don't have that level of, uh, of accuracy available to me. So, you know, I would be much better off giving a range of dates because that leads us to uh, something that's actually more honest. I know this is going to, I don't want to belabor the point on this, but, but Perry, none of us know. None of us really know because every job, there is just effort, right? How much typing you have to do, how much testing you have to do. But that's only one tiny component that's right. of the time that goes away. Actually, the other three are much bigger. So the second component is um, the risk. So if I'm going to touch this code, it might break things that I can't anticipate because I don't. I only know so much of the code base. So there's a risk that things might break, and if they do, we have to hunt down why they broke, so we can fix it, so that they won't break anymore. And we don't know that might take a minute. It might take a week. We, you know, it's hard to say. So risk is another element. So we got risk and effort, and then there's one more element that sits on top of that. Normally, is we don't know what we'll have to learn in order to know how to solve this problem. So we're at the edge of our knowledge all the time. I might need to just read a paper. I might just need to read a web page. I might have to dig. So those two things are not known. Now, I said there was four. There's one other, but we cannot predict at all. And that's delay or interruption. So I say this is going to take five days, but on day two, there's a production outage and we all have an all hands event. We need to go through and get the yeah. system working again. And that takes how long? Well, we didn't plan on it happening. We don't know. Um, maybe it took a day. Well, now my estimate is off by a day. Right. And then, 
you know, my child gets sick. I have to go to school and pick them up. Well, that's going to take four hours out of my day. Okay. Well, there's another loss. So if you think about it, effort, we're pretty good at if we know what everything is, but normally we have effort, mm -hmm. we have the uncertainty, the learning, right? We have the risk of breakage. And then we have the complete unknown of interruption. If we can get through those things, we could give an accurate assessment, but none of us ever knows how much those are going to be. Yeah. Just think of all the time it takes to come up with those estimates, right? I mean, the poker, the, the conversations, the time away. I mean, and then the comparing, right? Comparing yeah. one thing to another. I mean, yeah. some teams are able to do it in, you know, maybe 30 minutes, but I've seen sessions where people take hours and estimating, depending on how, how much, how, how many things are in that basket that need to be done. Yeah, so, I'll, I'll take a pause here uh, to announce uh, for the audience who have joined us. Uh, if you, we would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions, comments you want to ask us, ask the panel, please go ahead and add your comments and we will surely include those. And we already have an audience question, which I'll show up on the screen. And that's for you, Wyatt. In your oh. explanation of why we need estimates, you included the word visual or visualize. I can take that word many ways. Can you elaborate on what you intended? Sure, sure. So maybe let's uh, let's let's pull up uh, uh, one of the slides. I, uh, if we were to look at um, maybe jump ahead to slide eight. Yeah, exactly. So here's an example of, um, we, so what we use is throughput, like how many items we finish within a time period. And typically we, um, we look at these over the course of the week, right? And some, some teams could do two weeks, but you wanna amplify um, feedback much more, much sooner. And so, and get, yeah. Anyway, so we look at how much effort or how many things we've gotten through the system in a week, and then uh, we using the Mon using the Monte Carlo. It gives us a graph, and it gives us a graph showing 85, 95, you know, even greater than 95 percent. And when we talk with clients or talk with teams and talk with teams, we talk in terms of with 85 percent likelihood we will hit this date of October 14th. With 95 percent likelihood we'll hit um, finishing these things, and these things are. 100 items to be completed. That's that. This is that's the example here, that will complete within you know by the what is what is that looks like the uh, 20th or something like that. Anyway, so yeah. it's great having that visual representation when talking with um, uh, leadership in an organization because the 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 charts mean a lot, right? And so um, this is the sort of feedback that is very helpful. And there are other there are other ways of showing this. Um, let me use the word primitive only because maybe they're older styles, but um, if you look at uh, uh, slide number 10. Yeah, what I, I think that answers the question. Uh, we'll come back to how we use these techniques a, a little bit later, but first let's go back to what is probabilistic forecasting. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. So yes, Kevin, but... could you... Uh, could you talk about a little bit about what is a forecast and where this concept comes from? Yeah, we, we talked a lot about, uh, you know, why estimates are bad, right? We spent a lot of that time talking about what, what the problems are with uh, sort of the standard ways of estimating. So, um, and we, we hit the edges of this forecast idea. And uh, I think it was Perry or Tim that mentioned that, you know, forecasts have to have a range, right? Um, so this is an example of a forecast. It's in the weather context, right? Uh, we should all, we're, we're probably all familiar with weather, weather forecasts. And this in particular is a hurricane forecast. And what that white cone is saying is that that's the probable path of the storm. So we're saying that the storm is most likely, the center of the storm is most likely gonna fall inside of that white cone. The other really important piece of estimates is a confidence interval. So in the, in the case of hurricane forecast, typically we're looking at a 95% confidence interval. So 95% of the time, the storm will fall inside of, of that path. Um, and let's talk a little bit about how they're doing this. So if we go to the next slide, um, what they actually do is create what's called a spaghetti chart. So this chart is a bunch of simulations based on historical data, based on the data they have about the storm and about 
weather conditions in the environment and about all of this stuff, um, a bunch of simulations of where the storm might end up. And what they're actually doing is just, they're just saying, you know, 95% of these simulations end up inside of this cone, end up inside of this path. Um, and then they just update the forecast uh, really frequently. So we do something pretty similar to this uh, for forecasting the knowledge work, the type of uh, work that we're doing in building products. And we can generate uh, pretty much exactly this chart. If we go to the next uh, slide, we, we're just generating a, a spaghetti chart simulating burndowns, right? So this is what a Monte Carlo forecast is, is that we simulate uh, based on our historical data on how, much, how many things we've gotten done in the past. We simulate how many things do we think we might get done in the future. And we just pick a, pick a line. So if we want 85% confidence, we say, you know, 85% of these simulations ended on or before this date. And that's our forecast. That's what, that's, that's in a nutshell, what Monte Carlo forecasting really is. Thank you for that. Um, so why is Monte Carlo simulation or probabilistic forecasting uh, so important or crucial in today's dynamic business environment? Yeah, so so Tim mentioned um, all, all of these different pieces that go into how long something actually takes, how long it actually takes us to get things done. And a lot of these things are things that are, are really complex, right? We can't predict them. We don't know what's going to happen. But we can say with, with some confidence that the future is going to look pretty similar to the past, right? So we're likely going to have the same uh, risk of it, it, that we had in the past in the future. We're likely going to have the same types of delays. Obviously, there can be situations where, where new delays come up and, and things change and the world changes. But if that happens, then, then it's reasonable for our forecast to be off, right? So as long as the future looks similar to the past, we can use this model and say, you know what, we, we're just simulating that the future is going to look like it did before. And it, it's, it's pretty straightforward to do it. it. It takes a whole lot less effort than trying to uh, pretend that we can foresee all of these things. Yeah. I like that it won't tell you how to fit everything into your iteration, but it will probably tell you if you can't. Yeah. That's nice. Go ahead. A lot, the, a lot of the projects that I've worked on in the year over the past years, um, when they have been challenged or, or troubled, you know, people often beat themselves up on the team and say, well, if we were just better estimators, you know, if, if we could just somehow figure out how to, you know, to estimate the work better, you know, everything would go smoothly. Um, but the, the things that you suggested, Tim, there are so many things that are outside of our control that we just, we can't predict and we can't uh, control. And so, you know, the idea of, um, of uh, beating the team up or, you know, beating ourselves up, trying to, you know, get better. Tim, you and I have talked about this in the past. You said, you know, if if work was like rolling the dice, you know, you you know, you'd say, you know, why can't you predict the next roll of the dice more accurately? And it feels that way sometimes when we're asked to estimate work. And so, you know, um, you know, I, I've been aware of uh, Monte Carlo simulations, you know, for uh, a number of years. And when I uh, first got exposed to it, it was uh, very exciting because it was based on real concrete data by my team. And so it wasn't, I wasn't asking them to do other, anything other than um, do the work, you know, be as effective and efficient as you can. That's right. And um, yeah. let's look at the throughput. I think Kevin, you mentioned, uh, you know, the throughput. And so, um, yeah, it, it's a much more effective, efficient way of um, trying to answer the question, when are we gonna be done? And just like, you know, I think the hurricane um, forecasting model is, is a really good example. You know, it could go a number of different ways, but we have the ability to model that and come up with a range. And then that range gives us both the, um, the predicted, you know, where we think it'll most likely go and what our confidence interval is. One of the, one of the, I think the major benefits of people who are trying to follow, you know, the no estimates movement when, when that was being spoken of more often is that they decided to really work on trying to make the work better, right? So 
uh, Lean Startup and, and Reinhardt wrote the, the book on principles of product development flow, they started working on things like lead time and eliminating wastes and queues. And, and what they did was by managing their dependencies differently, by managing the work differently, True. they became more predictable at which point they didn't have to make guesses anymore. They know that they're always producing, you know, 18 things per fortnight or whatever. And the work is fairly consistent and people quit asking after a while. It's like, well, you know, they've got these many things to do. And so we expect by the middle of next month, we should be fine. And they see it happening. Um, whereas wherever people have maintained a chaotic system of work, and focused on being better at guessing, better at predicting, um, it tends to never actually get better. But what I like about the probabilistic forecasting is it doesn't matter which path you're on, right? Um, it can still say, yeah, well, you know, this is the normal craziness. And about 85% says it's going to be way out here. And if you work on the queuing and the chaos and the, and the problems in your system, it still comes in over time, right? It doesn't rely on your process so much, but it does describe your process and it describes your process in your team with the kind of work you do in your company. I think is really, that's what Perry was saying. It is very custom, custom it's very personal. Yeah, we, uh, at this time we have an audience question. So this one is from Alan. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, is, the, is the forecast probable range tighter or more accurate if all defined slices of work is roughly the same size? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, uh, the reality is that it doesn't matter if they're all the same size. That's right. What matters is that uh, the way that you're slicing things in the future are similar to the way that you slice things in the past. So, um, for example, if you if your team uh, is trying an experiment where every card is broken out into ten different cards, well, okay, your forecast is not going to be useful anymore, right? Um, but if your if your team is working in the same way in the future as they've been working in the past, so they're they're likely to slice a few things big, a few things small, a few things somewhere in the middle, um, then the forecast uh, just works it, because it's based on that historical data. Yeah, it's consistency yeah. not size. If you have always one really big thing three medium-sized things, and 12 trivial tasks. If it's always like that, more or less, it's always going to come out right. Yeah. yeah, it's the data sample. The more samples that you have, um, the the better or more accurate, uh, using that word that uh, you used earlier, uh, the forecast works. So you need uh, more data sets. You know, yeah. uh, my experience with, you know, Obviously, I think uh, all of y'all would agree, working on big things is less predictable than working on small things. So you know, we, we often coach our teams to slice the work and slice it into small pieces. So um, you know, if, you, you know, if you begin doing that, let's say, as Kevin said, uh, we, you start an experiment where we say, we're, as a team, we're no longer gonna work on, on really large pieces of work. We're going to intentionally slice that into smaller pieces. It's going to change the dynamic of your throughput because you'll be completing more things um, more quickly. But the nice thing about Monte Carlo is that you can decide what range of throughput will be the input for this forecast model. So if you have a, a big change in the team, maybe you add five people to the team or maybe three people leave or whatever, or if you change something um, dramatic about the way you are, are managing the work, you might want to make note of what date that happened on, and you can begin to uh, carve out the, you know, the data that's most meaningful for this new way of forecasting the, the future. And this is both, but also kind of important, I'll, and I imagine Kevin has something to say about this. We're shooting for accuracy, not precision, right? And so, you know, it's probabilistic. So it'll say it's most likely about maybe with why it's 85%. It's 85% likely that it'll land roughly on this date. Mm -hmm. So it's not trying to say at four o'clock on a Wednesday, that would be precision. It's about accuracy. So we're right plus or minus some element. We're 85% sure that this is going to be so. Um, Kevin, have you had to deal with the whole accuracy versus precision thing, or maybe why? I, I have, and the um, 
So when we create a forecast uh, using this Monte Carlo method, what we're really saying is that it's going to be on or earlier than this date, right? The, the latest simulations in that 85% group were on this date. There were a bunch of simulations that were earlier, right? So maybe it's going to be earlier because nobody's going to be upset if you're early, right? That, that's rarely a problem. Um, so we, we often, we always talk about that range being on or earlier than this date not it's going to be delivered exactly at this time. All right, so his Alan's comment continues and he's saying similarly, does the forecast suffer when the team or org is trying highly innovative work, tech that they haven't ever used before? Is that what they always do? <laughs> it's kind of the yeah. question is, is it unusual for them to be doing innovative work? Or is that the, the sample that we have to go from is innovative work of a similar vein? Yeah. Okay. Right. It, um, it comes down to does, does the, the bucket of work that you're trying to forecast look like the bucket of work that you've done in the past? Um, there's also in, in most of the tools that I'm aware of, and the, the two big ones are uh, Troy McGinnis has a bunch of free spreadsheets out there that you can find. And uh, Actionable Agile is another great tool. So most of these tools have the ability to add some, some sort of fudge factors. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, you, if you decide that, hey, we're going to be splitting work a lot farther, then we can put in an, a higher split rate, uh, things along those lines. So if you know that the future is going to look like the past, or the future is going to look different than the past in a certain way, you can use those tools to, to sort of account for that. All right, Martin West, he's asking, how do you ensure that one throughput is the same as the other throughput? Do you care because of the simulation covers any variability between the work involved in each item of throughput? You don't care. That's a skinny answer, you really don't care. Simple answer. Right, you yeah. care that in aggregate, the future looks like the past, right? Yes. And if, if that's not true, that's a problem, right? But um, if the future in aggregate looks like the past, you're fine. And I, I feel like I keep saying the same thing. Sorry. Yeah, because it's all about probabilities, right? That's why the, the Monte Carlo, the, the model underneath it, is taking many, many, many da data samples, like thousands, tens of thousands. In uh, Actionable Agile, you have the opportunity to look at like millions. And so and it's always doing that comparison. And because of that, it really doesn't matter. Just as long as you have data samples that you're always putting data samples in, the greater the data sample, the greater the accuracy of your uh, forecast. Which so why, why don't you uh, take us through an example that you, you have recently experienced simul with simulating the Monte Carlo, uh, and I'm going to share, share the slides here. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So there's a story with this. Um, so we were working with a client, and um, uh, it was one of my first times uh, with this team, and the the um, the manager, the VP of the organization uh, came in and said, uh, we've got to deliver this thing by uh, the end of May. It was March. You'll see uh, March 18th. And the look on everyone's faces was like, um, are you kidding me? And, and I asked, like, um, do we know the size of the effort? Can we do this? And everyone said, we have no idea. And so we did a quick story mapping session and we came up with at least 32 stories. And they said there are probably maybe at least 100 stories here. So we, we put a low guess of 32 and a high of, of 100. And then we said, OK, so and, and what Kevin was saying earlier, so split the stories. Do they split stories? Yes, we currently split stories. How often do you split them? Anywhere between two to three and a half, maybe four times. So we put in that range. We split stories two to three. And so, and then we put in um, our throughput uh, range, which is one week. And then you see the estimate and the estimate was in um, late December, early January. And the, um, the manager blew his cap. Are you effing kidding me? There's no, I, this is probably not the right team to be doing this work. It's, it's almost a direct quote. And so, um, we started to, uh, I, I did a couple of um, number crunchings and I looked at some possibility uh, of 
growing the team, adding more people to it. So right now this team was four. And so we started forecasting what it would look like if we added more people. And so the manager agreed of more than doubling the team. So we went from four that week to six the next week to eight the next week and 10 the next week. And if you look at, and the, what, one of the great things about this, uh, this area, uh, there are many teams in this area, but they were already rotating. And so we could pull people back into this team because they had domain knowledge of the code base. And so on the next slide, if we pull up slide 11, you'll see that uh, we have some data samples, right? We started with nine, nine stories as a throughput for the first team, and then we added more people. Now we start getting some consistencies, 27, 25, 29. Now you'll say, well, there's that 17. Well, that's, you, we can explain that very easily. Two people had holiday, and so um, um, they, they dropped throughput. But the rest of the data set was very consistent, 29, 25, 25, 25. And so what happened was, as we were entering this data, we saw that the date was starting, starting to um, show up sooner. And when the team actually finished this, they finished it in June, early June. It wasn't December, it wasn't January. So running using this forecast as a technique of saying, we need to increase the team size, we could do that right off the bat. So if we, if you could pull up uh, slide number 12, right? So that shows that they, so they, they finished on the 15th of June. And that was the team of 10. And the, the CTO of our company was like really thrilled because they had to interface with an external um, vendor, IBM. And it absolutely had to be done then. There's no way it could have been uh, it was not acceptable to deliver this in December or January. So this was, this was a technique that we used to help them figure out well, how do we deliver this sooner. So we sliced the stories, we put in low guess number of stories, and then the actual. So if you look on line, what is that, 17 of that spreadsheet, this is data. And the data is using the throughput samples that you saw in the previous slide in slide 11. Yep, this one. Yep. Yeah, and this so, is this is how we use Monte Carlo for effective product management, right? Is that we yeah. we trust the forecast first of all, um, and based on trusting that forecast, we make a decision about how we're going to change the future, right? If if we need to. So in this case, in Wyatt's case, they they added more people because that was a reasonable choice in their environment. It would have been just as valid to say, you know what, we're going to push back the date. We're going to adjust our marketing plans or whatever it is. That's right. Or we're going to cut scope. We're going to do fewer things uh, in the same time frame. But uh, trusting the forecast was the was the starting point of them being able to make a good decision, a good product management decision uh, using this forecast. So essentially what Monte Carlo is doing is running the simulation multiple times to give us the calculation. How does that work, Perry? Yeah, so uh, yeah, these different tools have uh, different configurations. I um, I used the the spreadsheet version that uh, you're seeing here uh, as a beginning point. Later, moving to uh, a a tool that was the actual Agile that uh, Kevin mentioned earlier, uh, and um, there there's a an option that uh, you can choose that would tell you how many different simulations it would run. By default, it would run 10,000 simulations. But that was oh. uh, something you could adjust. And I mean, on, on occasion, I would experiment with running more to see if it changed the, uh, the results. I could bump it up to a million. So uh, it could run a million different simulations with the same input. And, um, you know, it doing that gave me greater and greater confidence with um, the answers it was producing. So, you know, uh, being able to do that so easily um, was a game changer. And right. the nice thing about uh, a tool like the one we're looking at with, uh, you know, a spreadsheet is that it's free. It, it's out there and it's been made available to everybody. So there's really no excuse to not try this. Um, it does require that you manually enter your results, uh, your throughput data. 
And I, th I think Wyatt showed an example of what that looks like uh, just a minute ago. Uh, but it's, that's not hard to do. I mean, it, it requires some bookkeeping on your end to keep track of that and then plug it in and run the simulations. Um, but the nice thing with uh, other tools like, like Actual Agile, it's integrated with tools you're probably already using, uh, tools like Jira or tools like uh, Combinize. Uh, they've already incorporated that as a third-party plugin. And with the client I was working with, uh, we started doing this. Uh, that team was really struggling with uh, estimates. Um, they would spend uh, days and days trying to, you know, estimate the work, trying to get better and better estimates. And when we introduced uh, Monte Carlo simulations, we could say, you know, you don't have to carry that burden on your shoulders. We can look at the, the throughput of the team historically. We can run these mm -hmm. simulations and we can uh, forecast a, uh, a date range with a confidence interval. And uh, that that began uh, a big significant change in the way the team worked. So um, yeah, being able to, to run um, not just a handful of simulations, but literally thousands of them or even millions of them uh, gives you a lot of confidence that you, know, you wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah, and I, I realize that we keep on uh, saying this word simulations and uh, I just want to describe really quickly what what it's actually doing. Um, if we pull up slide 11 for a second, uh, these are our throughput samples. These are the number of cars that we got done in each week, I, I would assume. Yes. And all it's doing in the background is it's rolling a dice and saying, OK, uh, the dice roll was 6, so I'm going to pick 25. Roll a dice again, the dice roll was 6, so I'm going to pick 29. So that's, that's the throughput that it chooses for each week. And then it says, OK, when we got to 100 things done, because that's what the number of things that we were forecasting, we're going to say we were done. We're going to track what week that was. And then we're going to do it again. We're going to roll the dice until we get to 100 things. Then we're going to do it again and again and again. And it does that 10,000 times. You could do this manually, right? Um, I don't think anyone would enjoy it, but you could do it manually. Uh, so that's why these spreadsheets exist, to, to take off all of that, uh, that rolling the dice. And I love how it, it, it doesn't have it's not subject to either optimism nor pessimism. It just, one answer is as good as another. It just picks them randomly, mechanistically. What I really like about using um, either the spreadsheet or the actionable agile, I've seen often that management stops asking the team, when will it be done? And they're mm -hmm. simply just pulling up the, um, the chart to see how things are going. And so it yeah. takes, it, it takes that burden that, what you said earlier, Perry, it takes the burden off the team. The team can focus on doing the best work that they can, as opposed to, you know, I've got to hit this date, got to hit this date, right? And then um, then uh, management can make some decisions on what they need to do in the background. Yeah. One other comment about that. There's some interesting dynamics. I, I, you said it very well, Wyatt, that um, once this information becomes available to uh, to the team and to the stakeholders, it shifts the focus and people, you know, can look at that and say, okay, I, I have a, a date range and let's say that the date range is acceptable. You know, well, it gives the team the freedom to continue to work, but you're right. You can run this like every day, you know, you can run these simulations as often as you like. And there'll, there'll be a point when, you know, the date has moved. And as soon as the date begins to move, you're aware of it because the simulations are telling you now that you're not, uh, in a zone where you think you're going to, where you would like to be, but it invites you to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, you know, Kevin, you, you said it really well. I mean, we can either, we can add more people, we could reduce the scope, you know, or change the date. That's right. So, but it puts the control back into the team, you know, and into the stakeholders and gives them the information they need to make informed decisions. And that, that's what I love about it. Yeah. So another question we have, uh, Michael on LinkedIn, he is asking, curious about organizational dynamics. What is the lowest probability that was accepted for our data? As an engineer, I like 85%. Is there an experience with say a 50% probability forecast or does the business generally accept the recommended confidence level? <laughs> I know that, that's why it's gonna have this in just a second, but I wanna throw out there. Remember, um, gamblers love 50-50. <laughs> 
Yeah. And if you get 50 50 odds, that, that's exciting enough to go for and likely enough that it's a good game. <laughs> a lot of companies don't gamble like that. So I'll that's let right. Wyatt go with what's well, so in his mind, but I wanted to throw out there some places might go with gamblers' odds. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, some people might go with 50 50, but the most organizations I've seen, uh, management tends to want something uh, 80% or higher. And so that's usually where we go. And then I've, I've worked with teams where management says, I really need 100%, but I'm willing to go 90%. So yeah, yeah it's just feedback for them. That's all it is. Yeah. The way I usually talk about this is I say, you know what? Um, the 50% chance is, you know, I, I'm a gambling man. If you're game for a coin flip, I am too. But um, are you game for a coin flip? And and I have never heard someone in, in a business context say, yes, I am. <laughs> That's right. That's good. The interesting thing about the uh, the confidence interval, uh, you know, I think eighty five percent. That was a, a sweet spot for the team I uh, I worked with most recently using this. Um, and when the when the de the deadline date was you know six eight months away, eighty five percent confidence interval was great. You know, it was close enough. It was a high enough confidence interval that the team could could focus on the work and you know we could track to the expected date within that range and everything's fine but when the date started getting closer you know when we were no longer you know eight six months out we were getting more like uh, you know four or three or you know months away we switched and we started looking more closely at 95 percent confidence okay. because missing yeah. it at 15 percent began to be an unacceptable uh, margin of error. So uh, it's nice that the tool gives you that um, those other ranges that, you know, most of those re report them out and you can shift your focus to using a, a higher level of uh, confidence. Yeah. So Joseph on LinkedIn is kind of agreeing with you, Perry. He's saying, love the response, uh, Tim Odinger. I also remember that these type of techniques get more accurate and precise as the, as the project merges closer to the delivery date, which leads me to the question, who and how often should you forecast? As often as possible. Right. Um, the, so we get new information every day about how the team's operating. Right. Um, if you're if you're using daily, daily throughput numbers, we've got new information every single day, and we could uh, with one of these tools, we can really easily create a new forecast every single day. Right. All it is is sticking the new number in the in the throughput uh, spreadsheet. So um, as often as you reasonably can, as as often as you can have a good conversation about what does this forecast mean for what we should do going forward. And what Perry was say, I'm sorry, Tim. Go ahead. Oh, I was just saying. Um... You know, I don't know that like doing it more is always better. Uh, there's, but there's probably some motivation when you want to check again. You know, so it's when you probably, you know, when you feel the need for that confidence boost for one thing, um, and probably should be somewhat periodic anyway, just because you know it could tell you things you weren't expecting to hear. So, um, you know, I, maybe that's different per team. But as you were saying, Wyatt, why don't you go ahead? You had something for Perry. Yeah, so what I was uh, going to add is that um, there's this one client that we're working with. The team is made up of 20 people, 20 engineers. And so we have we have five to six sub teams within that. And we're looking at forecasts all the time because the throughput is very dynamic. And uh, it really helps us to understand, um, you know, maybe we lower our, rip, our whip for a certain period for this or increase the whip, you know, that sort of thing. So it, it really, really depends on your situation. Um, I'm a firm believer of uh, more feedback often because that helps us make decisions. And this is a feedback mechanism. It's a feedback tool. It's like, what do we need to do? And sometimes we will say, okay, this team that's working in India, can you guys work with the UK team a little bit to help move this thing through the system? You know, And we get that information through this. So with the um, Actional Ag Agile tool, all you have to do is really push a button. Uh, with the spreadsheet, you've got to enter some data, right? And the data is the throughput. So that's the biggest difference. If, if we go back to the sort of hurricane forecast uh, example, the way that they do it, is, because those those simulations are really expensive to run, right? They, they need to be run on uh, supercomputers and they, they're they expensive to do. 
um, the way they do it is when the when the hurricane is far out at sea, they run simulations once every 12 hours, I think. And I, I could be wrong about the numbers, but they run them every 12 hours. And as it gets closer, as it's about a day away from land, they start running them every six hours. And it, as it's about to make landfall, they start running them every three hours. So they they start running them more frequently when the risk is higher. And this sort of goes along with what Perry was saying that, you know, as we get closer to the end of the project, our needs change, right? We Maybe we need a more a higher accuracy level, right? We need that 95% confidence. And maybe we need to run these uh, more frequently. Or maybe because we are changing the way that we're working, we're changing our, uh, our target whip levels. Um, we want that feedback more frequently because we want to see how is this, how is this change affecting uh, what might happen in the future. So um, how often you run it is really dependent on, on your context, right? What, what do you need? Uh, but more often is often better. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Joseph on LinkedIn. He's saying, how do you visualize to the client using these forecasts, the impact of onboarding new member midway through a project? I imagine using a rolling mean to pick up changes to team velocity throughput could help. Yeah, we're really getting into some, some of the intricacies of flow here and how to use different types of flow metrics to uh, sort of visualize some of the impacts to a team. Um, I, I would not use these forecasts to talk about the impact of onboarding new members. I would, I would start with talking about the impact to cycle time um, and look at something like a cycle time scatter plot to see that. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I would go. I, I wouldn't use these forecasts in that context. I would agree. Yeah, we tend to um, keep sort of the, the nuts and bolts uh, under the covers of throughput and cycle time uh, from the client that we're working with right now that it gives us information of, of things that we can tweak. Uh, we, we use the forecast of being able to hit the date that they want for their marketing. And so if we need to um, have greater throughput, we will look at strategies of maybe onboarding more people or doing um, changing our mobs, um, our ensembles, maybe try pairs and mobs, depending on, on, on really the context. Um, so we, we look at internally uh, under the covers as a team things to use um, to make sure that that helps us meet the end date of what the client is trying to do for their marketing campaign. So why, how much does it matter to stakeholders and how, uh, and how can uh, these simulations of this data could be interpreted for, for the higher management or for the stakeholders? Yeah, so we have um, this one particular client, we have meetings twice a week and they want to understand um, how are we in hitting the date and we use the date range. And uh, the date range is 85 to 95 or greater percent um, likelihood um, because they specifically have customers that they are using as beta testers and the customers need to understand when they're going to receive the product. You know, we, you know, being able to turn the feature flag on or off for things that uh, are already in production. So they, they are communicating with their clients every single week and, prepping them for delivery in October is what we're shooting for. Great. Um, so what are some of the risks uh, involved with this? Uh, do you think there's any pitfalls or challenges using these uh, simulations in your projects? The, the biggest challenge that I've seen is that people don't trust them. They, they say, we'll give them a forecast and they'll say, uh, well, that's not a number I like, so it can't be right. Um, and what one of the things that I've done to try and address that in the past is I've, um, so say we've got a year's worth of data if we're using something like Jira, Canvanize, it's not unusual for us to have a lot of historical data. Um, I'll take the first six months of that year and I'll use that to forecast the last six months of the year. And I'll say, you know, how many things do you think you got done in that last six months? Or how many things did the forecast say we would have gotten done? And almost every time it is right on the nose. And that's really, really eye-opening for these groups. It's not exact, 
but it's usually very, very, very close. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the example that I showed earlier where um, the manager needed it by the end of May and the CTO, uh, he couldn't tell the CTO it was going to be in January, February. And when we came up with the strategy and he was able to sell the CTO in early June without any problem whatsoever. So being able to see that and have that confidence, and that's where we were. They delivered it on the 15th, you know, so greater than 85%, around 95%, 90%. And as a result of that, more teams started to adopt this approach and this technique. It's a huge, huge corporation. Um, Muneev, I, I see we're getting a lot of questions, um, and I, I know we're getting close to the end here. Is there a yeah. way that folks can uh, come to us if they've got more questions or they want to get uh, some more details? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if they wanna if they wanna reach out to us, they can definitely book a free Q and A session. If they got any questions about our engineering services or they wanna book a one hour session to discuss their needs, there is the QR code and the and the URL available for that, and you can hop onto that and book that session. Um, we also have a special discount code that we have for our uh, next public technical excellence workshop coming up on January 8th and February 29th. And this, this code would give you actually, would actually give you a 20% discount on that. So uh, if you would like to utilize that, this would be a really good opportunity for that one. Um, this event was part of the live events we had planned, Industrial Logic had planned for this uh, month. So this one is the fourth one. We already had three events this uh, month and all of those are available on our social media uh, sites, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on our YouTube channel, and they're also available on our website. Uh, so if you hop onto industriallogic.com, you should be able to find these live events and the recordings are available. We also have a lot of free resources on the industriallogic.com. So a lot of cheat sheets, canvases, things like that, that could be really useful. So if you, uh, please go ahead and, and visit our website and you can find all these details there. Hey, Manif, could you go back to the one on the technical excellence workshop? Because there's something special hidden in that. Uh, that's, uh, first, yeah, I believe um, this is the first one that's being added in a time zone specifically friendly to EU developers. Okay. So if you're in the UK, the EU, you know, anywhere in Europe, maybe even in uh, Western Asia, you might be able to find a workshop that you can join or send your team into uh, and to learn all these the technical excellence um, techniques and attitudes which until now has only ever been offered in the U.S. time zone. Nice. So this is the first time run, and hopefully this will be helpful to many people. Awesome. So uh, before we end this, uh, there's one last question from Michael. He's saying, how are number of stories estimated? This seems to be a key input for the forecast. Risk unknown learnings and unanticipated delays are handled by Monte Carlo and our and stories are statistically tied to effort. Go for it, Jim. <laughs> but you know, this is again, it's about consistency, right? So if you're doing it the same way, you always do it. You know, if you're, uh, if it was 18 last time and you're guessing 18 this time, if it's been 15 and you're guessing 15 or seven and you're guessing seven, um, things should be pretty good. And if you change how you guess the number of stories, then yeah, you're changing an input. Um, and that, you know, that might cause a break from historic data. Anything that breaks from historic data can add uncertainty into the forecasting. And I think that's a good call. That's definitely the thing that happens. And you may throw a fudge factor in guessing which way it might run. But the fact is we've broken from historical data at that point and we're going to have to gather new data if we change how we do things. It, it's interesting to note that the um, that the throughput data is in, completely independent of the method that you uh, use to arrive at that throughput. So you know uh, if you're using Scrum and you're doing uh, you know uh, two week sprints and you're trying to estimate you know how many stories will fit in a two week sprint. 
And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. It doesn't matter because the yeah. only thing that is counted is how many you actually got done. So, uh, yeah. and that's true if you're doing, uh, you know, uh, Scrum with sprints or whether you're doing more of a flow base with Kanban. The only thing that is really contributing to the Monte Carlo simulation forecasting is how many things wound up in the done column. Yeah, I would encourage folks to try it one week and just count the things that you get done for that week. I mean, some people say, well, you know, don't don't count a story as development or testing. Whatever you use in the beginning, just start with something and, and have it be consistent. And so if your stories happen to be um, design, development, testing, integration, deployment, if it happens to be that, just be consistent and use that for a while. And then and then change your approach so that a story includes all of those things, right? But it's really, really small. And that's what we do. Every story is very small and includes all of those things. And so when we work as a team, we're constantly pushing things through the system, but they're all very, very small. And it tends to be that each one of those stories of small capability can be done within, you know, a couple of days at most. Yeah. But, one, it, but it doesn't matter what you use in the beginning. Just use something, keep it consistent. But I would, I would start tracking it weekly, not every two weeks, because you want to amplify feedback. So then you can adjust. One, one quick note about the, the Monte Carlo forecasts. Um, we've talked a lot about forecasting. When will this bucket of stories be done? So say we've got, we think we've got 100 stories. When will that be done? Um, there's another form of that forecast that is answering the question, how many stories will we have done by this date? And um, that that is built into all of these tools as well. Uh, and so if you have a big marketing push before the Super Bowl, let's say, um, you can say, you know, how many things can we have done before the Super Bowl? And uh, that that is often a really valuable way to do this. And it's sort of um, sidesteps the question of how do we estimate how many stories there are in this bucket because we don't have to estimate the bucket anymore. All right. All right. Um, I think that's uh, the end of line for us. So I would like to thank everybody in the audience for joining, for listening in, tuning in. And uh, for those who participated asking the question, thank you so much. I would also like to thank this speaker panel for taking out the time and sharing their experiences with us. For those of you who joined a bit late, these are recorded sessions. So these are available on all of Industrial Logic social media platforms and on industriallogic.com. Um, uh, and we will be joining next week or next month for the upcoming sessions. And we will definitely announce them on, on our social media. So see you guys soon with another topic and with another speaker panel. Good bye. Hey, just one thing. Can you pop up the uh, Q&A thing again in case someone came late? Because it seems like there's still many questions out there and it'd be an opportunity for people to, to say, Yeah, hey, for let's... those of you who didn't get any answers, uh, questions answered this, this session, please feel free to book a free Q&A session with one of our uh, experts. And uh, here's a QR code and a URL on our website where you can go and do that. And we'll definitely take care of you. Thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Thanks. Cheers.